Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Mark's English History Channel available on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and now available on Buzzsprout Podcasts. This is the second of two episodes looking at the events surrounding one of the most pivotal battles moments in European history, the Battle of Waterloo, whose anniversary falls on the 18th of July. If you haven't already seen my previous episode, Prelude to Waterloo, I suggest you watch that video first, and I'll pop the link to that video in the comments below. Now on, now let's get on to the battle itself. So Napoleon and Wellington, the two commanders at this, the two major commanders at this battle, this showdown has, has been 46 years in the making. Both men were born in 1769. Both men were born away from the political centres of their respective countries. Napoleon was born in the town of Ajaccio on the Mediterranean island of Corsica, which was recently annexed by France from the Republic of Genoa. Napoleon was descended from a minor Italian aristocratic family. Wellington, meanwhile, was born in Dublin, Ireland, to an Anglo-Irish aristocratic family. Both men would have wide-ranging careers before facing each other, before facing each other. Napoleon would leave Corsica to attend the military academy of Brienne Le Chateau, where he excelled at engineering and artillery. Often bullied due to his Corsican accent, Napoleon was found during his spare time mapping out approach trenches to fortifications. And after graduating from the military academy, Napoleon would go on to serve with an artillery regiment in the Royal French Army. However, his career would be paused by the outbreak of the revolution in 1788. During the, uh, during the aftermath of the revolution, Napoleon would return to Corsica, often a Corsican independence supporter, Napoleon will be seduced by the ideas of the revolution. And so when Corsica tried to succeed from, from France, Napoleon broke from his independence mentor and fought for the revolutionaries in Corsica instead. It was at the siege of Toulon when Napoleon's rise truly began. Having befriended the younger brother of the leading revolutionary Robespierre, Napoleon devised a plan to take the city through artillery alone. The success of the Napoleon's plan resulted in him being appointed to, the command, to command the revolutionary forces artillery, a position that he would use when, it, when the time came to seize power himself. Napoleon's France would unleash o over 20 years of war on the European continent until his eventual defeat in 1814. Wellington didn't attend a military academy, instead he used family connections to enter military service. His early career saw him serving in his native island and the Low Countries without much fanfare. It was after he was posted to India that he began to, that he began to make an impression. Again, it would be family connections that would give Wellesley his opportunity. His brother Richard was Governor General when, of India when war broke out against the Tipu Sultan of Mysore. The forces arranged to defeat the Tipu needed the commander, and Richard, now known as Lord Mornington, gave it to his younger brother Arthur. Victories at Sarangapatam and the Sai soon followed. However, Wellesley was growing tired of India and requested to return home. When his brother's term in India came to an end, they both returned together at the same time. The returning Wellesley found him found finding a command hard upon his return, and it was at this point in 1805 that there was a meeting, a very brief meeting between the Wellesley and and Nelson prior to Nelson's death. Although this was only when they well. Wolsey was sitting in the office as, Nepo as Nelson came past, so it wasn't they weren't formally didn't formally meet, so to speak. And the reason, one of the reasons why he found the um, getting a command so hard was he was often derived as being a sepoy general and not a, a, a true a true general. However, he was given a small command during the attack on Copenhagen, 
but it was in the peninsula that Wellesley, now Viscount Wellington, would secure victory after victory that would lead to Napoleon's eventual overthrow in 1814. So what are the armies that are going to be involved at the Battle of Waterloo? So firstly, the British Army, usually associated with the scum of the earth, the British Army was actually one of the most profic proficient in the world. Wellington's Peninsula Army was possibly the best army Britain has ever put into the field. Unlike the European counterparts, the British Army was not made up of conscript but of volunteers. Although Numerous examples of coercion of getting men into, to volunteer do exist. So, for example, you get um, recruiting sergeants getting potential volunteers drunk, sign the form and then recruit them again in the morning when they're sober, telling them that they've already signed up. You have examples of magistrates offering military service in, in lieu of, of the time in jail, for example. Um, so it, it was a voluntary force, but there was um, plenty of examples of where coercion and conscripts in terms of um, serving in the military rather than jail time do, um, do occur. These men were highly trained with, um, with the red coat armed with his Indian pattern musket, often referred to as the Brown Bess. Brown Bess was never a name that was officially adopted for it. Um, and the actual, what we today know as the Brown Bess is often mixed up in that there's three versions of that, uh, of a flint like musket. There's the long land pattern, short land pattern, and then the Indian pattern um, being the latest, the last one before which is what they use at Waterloo before it moves over to the percussion cap version later on, which is what is going to be used in um, the first Afghan war, for example, and then the Enfield um, rifle musket that comes in by the time we get to the Crimea. Um, but so these men are armed with the Indian pattern muskets, capable of firing three rounds a minute um, for good soldiers. So sort of two, two to three rounds a minute is 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 the norm um very um very unstable in wet weather and um, sometimes it can go off every time sometimes it's you're lucky if the, if you get the first one off okay great, great but after that it can be a bit um they can be very temperamental and this red coat the red coat was the mainstay of the army each regiment found some men strong on paper split into 10 companies of 100 men with a grenadier company, the tallest, biggest soldiers on the right, and the light companies, the smallest, fittest, and most intelligent on the left. These are these guys would go out and form a skirmish line in front of the main bulk of the army, which are the centre companies. We also have specialist rifle regiments in the um, in the British Army at this time, with their green jackets and armed with the Baker rifle. That's the people in the middle. If you're watching on YouTube, the top middle photograph there, um, armed with his famous Baker rifle. It's a small percentage of the army, um, but they are trying to operate in pairs, looking for individual targets. Are mostly officers and drummer boys. The command structure of the enemy army. Also within the British Army, we've got the artillery, they are in the blue uniforms because they're technically not part of the British Army, but, up, but personnel of the Board of Ordnance. So that's why they're in blue. Then we have um, our cavalry divisions, so two groups. Light cavalry would operate as the eyes and ears of the army. Fast and mobile, scouting ahead of the army, finding out where the French were, um, looking for signs of enemy activity, engaging with picket duties, things like that. And on the battlefield, they'll be deployed to counter en the enemy's light cavalry as well. Also got the heavy, heavy cavalry there. And these are the shock troops, shock force of the army used to inflict crushing blows on enemy infantry. And they sold their sole purpose is um, is is on the battlefield. They're, they're not used with that much for scouting. Um, the horses and the men, they're too big for that. So they're, they're, they're there to inflict the crushing blows on the battlefield. And that's pretty much their sole purpose. 
so the battle of so the Battle of Waterloo wasn't just the British Army, it was a allied army of, of multiple different nations. So within the British Army itself, we do have two um, large blocks of German, German infantry. Um, so again, if you've watched the previous video, you'd know about the, the why the Hanoverian link with the Hanoverian king in Britain and the Germans escaping to Britain following the invasion of these small nation states by Napoleon in the first part of the um, of the Napoleonic Wars leading up to his eventual defeat in 1814. These troops are still in the British army at this time. So you've got the King's German Legion and the Brunswickers. The, these are two of the big formations of German troops within the British Army. So like I say, Germans who had left their native soil after being overrun by Napoleon offer safety and opportunity to continue the fight against Napoleon for the British. King's German Legion can be hard to tell apart from the British. They also had soldiers in both red and green, armed similarly to the British with the artillery arm they were an army within an army. The Brunswickers distinct in their black uniforms served under their own Duke until his death at the Battle of Catra two days earlier, and they made up the army that would serve under Wellington. So alongside Wellington's British army, there's the Royal, the, the Royal Netherlands army commanded by the William the Prince of Orange. This army was bolstered by the addition of Picton's 5th Division, as Wellington was unsure about the calibre of this force. He, he, well, he put one of his hard fighting divisions in, under their command to um, make sure that he was comfortable with at least one division. The Netherlands army was unknown on the battlefield. Many of the men serving in this army recently served with Napoleon. The area that today Belgium was only transferred to the Netherlands at the Treaty of Vienna, which followed um, Napoleon's first abdication in 1814. They usually had, um, they wore blue uniforms with orange or red facings on them, so to, to distinguish themselves. So the enemy, the French army. For nearly 20 years, the French army was almost invincible, but the day, the, these days seemed long in the memory. Defeat in Russia led to the downfall of Napoleon. However, with his return, his veterans had fed once more to the colours. As time was short, these men were kitted out in the, with their old equipment, but were still well equipped and good soldiers. For many, though, this would be the first time they were facing the acid test of the British Army, yet for the others, they had experienced this before. For the French, as much as the Allies, as much was at stake. So French uniforms, traditionally blue. Um, you've got, if you're, gonna, if you're watching the video here, the top three photographs are of the standard line infantry. Napoleon also had um, his Imperial Guard, which are, were his undefeated veterans. And those guys are the ones in the bottom left of the picture there are blue uniforms, but with white, white face, white facings, white cross belts and, and bear skins. And this is his elite guard. Um, often used in the final actions just to push off um, and destroy any remaining enemy resistance. You've also got light cavalry, heavy cavalry, artillery, all, all the arms, the same as the British, the French have as well. Um, so a, two, the armies are fairly well and evenly matched. So last but not least, you've got the third element of what's the, the army that is going to come into play at the battle of on the battlefield at Waterloo, and these are the Prussians. So the Prussians have been badly mauled at the hands of the French at the Battle of Ligny, which occurred at a similar uh, simultaneously to the Battle of Quatre Bras, but they were not defeated, as its head and at its head was the experienced and loved commander of Blücher. Rescued from under his horse at Ligny and preparing his army once more to go into battle with the French. When the Prussian army moves, unknown a portion of the French army was dispatched to find it and, and, in, and to engage it. Wearing dark blue, sometimes described as black Prussian uniform, could easily be confused with the French at a distance. 
the main body of the Prussian army were conscripts or the Landwehr forces, which were more like a territorial force designed to be raised and used for, for homeland defence. But in this occasion, they're, they're, they're going to pull, they're marching outside their borders so as to attack a known threat. And so these are the forces that will come into play on the 18th of June. So the initial deployments of the battle, so as I discussed in the last episode, Wellington's forces retreating from the battlefield of Catrebra took up position on the 17th of June, a position identified by the, by the soon-to-be known Duke of Wellington, at this point again still Viscount Wellington, a year earlier. The Anglo-Allied position ran alongside a ridge ran along a ridge known as the Mont Saint-Jean Ridge, named after the farmhouse on the reserve reverse slope of the ridge and this farmhouse is now a brewery. The Brussels Chalois Road besects this position through the centre. The position is anchored by three fortified farmhouses. So on the right and forward of the ridge from Wellington's point of view stands Ugamon. Now this was going to be held by the guard, by section of the guards, um, what we today, the regiment we today know as the Coldstream Guards were the Guards Regiment that would hold this position. In the centre and at the base of the ridge, so directly below the ridge, lays Le Hessant and this is held by elements of the King's German Legion with, with members of the 95th Rifles stationed across the road from the farmhouse in the sand pit. At and then on the extreme left of the battlefield was a farmhouse called Papalot. Now Papalot doesn't have any bearing on the battle whatsoever. So that's going to be the last time we actually speak of this fortified farmhouse. On the crest of the ridge was the Allied artillery with the main bodies of the army on the reverse slope protected from French artillery. And this is a tactic that Wellington has favoured throughout his career. Take a locate your army on a ridge that, that dominates the ground as the ridge at Waterloo did then it still does although to this to an extent because of the building the way it was remodeled when they built when the mound was built it doesn't have quite such a dominating feature as it did back then and then use that ridge to protect your troops from the enemy so you're, not only are the troops protected from bombardment but also it, it, it it makes the enemy commander guess as to where the dispositions of, the, of your troops are by being back there. So a, a move Wellington often favoured. But on the left of the battlefield under the command of the Prince of Orange, you do have Binance Brigade. And they're the only major formation that is forward of the slope on the ridge. So that's the only one that's going to be able to that will be taking impact almost straight away from Napoleon's artillery and is going to be visible to the French the whole way through for the majority of the battle. Across the shallow valley from the Fet, the French took up position on the low ridge that runs parallel with the Mont Saint Jean ridge. And at the centre of this ridge, along the Russell Shalwa Road, lies a tavern called the La Belle Alliance. And at this position, there's an intersection of roads and a track from that leads off of from the Belle Alliance runs down towards the village of Plassenbois, which is sort of to the west and back to the south to the southwest of the Belle Alliance position. So that's roughly where the main elements of the battle are going to take place. And then further back along the Brussels Chalois Road was Napoleon's headquarters of the Maison de Calou. And this is where Napoleon spends the night before the battle. It becomes its initial headquarters. Uh, but as the battle begins, he will move up to the Belle Alliance, will become his main headquarters. Now, along that ridge, Napoleon will place his artillery in his traditional style style of a grand battery set so all the cannons all together wheel to wheel 
in one big battery and um, where the British would intersect their artillery with it but with the gaps of infantry formation so it's less of a block but a slightly wider coverage as a result um, but Napoleon likes to use his artillery in what we would today call shock and awe tactics so it's gun to gun wheel to wheel so that when it opens up it's going to open up with a with power and that's what that's what he's hoping for so that's why he set always sets his his guns up in that manner so another another the tradition that napoleon had was to parade his own army in view of the enemy now in most of the battles napoleon fought the battle was won before the first shots were fired due to in parading the army the aura that napoleon's armies had before it and the fact that in most place most times they were facing conscript group conscript troops um that didn't once well, they didn't have the stomach for the fight but they were easier they would run easier than the than the british the british had a tendency just to nail themselves to a position and hold it whereas a lot of the other countries tended to have a their conscript troops tended to run um easier so it, he this parading motion that Napoleon had, it was all part of the glamour of Napoleon. You parade the army, Napoleon's riding up and down the front of it. To somebody, to, to a raw recruit who's facing this for the first time, there's a psychological impact, and that is what um, Napoleon is doing with this true, this parading of, of his armies. However, he'd never faced wellington's brits he traced british regiments in spain in the early part he was down there um with the early defeats around um sir john moore's corona campaign for example he was down in, in in spain for that but for the most part he he was dealing with west um eastern europe so places like Austerlitz or um, the attack the, the, the invasion of um, russia the battle of nations at Leipzig following the invasion of Russia so he, he tends to be in that area so he he hadn't fought Wellington uh, but also something that we also have to bring into mind when we're talking about the dispositions that as a result of the storm that followed the battle of Quatre Bras the field between the armies was waterlogged and this delayed Napo not only delayed Napoleon placing his guns but would reduce the effect of the shot so he were, the, the gunners were unable to ricochet the round shot off the ground like a skimming stone um through enemy through troop formations the, the ground was thick it was waterlogged um the ground at waterloo is it it's not that far away from places like Ypres that we know from the first world war how waterlogged and wet that got so this wet ground um, it's not ideal um, so because critically Napoleon delays the start of the battle waiting for the ground to dry out now we've spoken about the British and the French positions but what about the Prussians well they were on the move Blucher's left a portion of his army at a place called Wave and they engage with the large portion up to a third of napoleon's army which was under the command of grouchy and gerard that he dispatched after the battle of Ligny to chase the prussians out of the netherlands and back to prussia um, but what had happened as we discussed in the last episode is that they both blucher and wellington's troops had retreated on parallel lines now blucher leaves a holding force at wave to engage with Grouchy and Blucher uh, and Gerard and Blucher has set his troops in motion west towards the towards Wellington's battlefield of choice and it was on the instruction that Blucher would come to Wellington's aid that Wellington decided to make his stand at the ridge of Mont Saint-Jean as we shall call it for the moment so how did the battle start the battle commenced 
11am, 11.30am, um, varying sources suggest somewhere between those times is when the ground, bat the ground battery received orders to open fire. And at the same time, Jerome Bonaparte's and Napoleon's younger brother was instructed to launch a diversionary attack against Ugamon on Wellington's right. At the time of the battle, there was a wood to the south of the farm that extended up to the track that runs around the farmhouse walls. Today, there's a few witness trees that still stand and they mark the northern extremity of that wood and how close it was to the farmhouse. The woods were defended by German Jaeger troops, so skirmish riflemen troops operating as skirmishers within the woods. So within, within, thick, within thickets, within woodland, standard normal infantry line tactics, standing shoulder to shoulder, does, it is unable to, you're unable to fight in that manner. So instead, they, they break into a skirmish line, fighting in their pairs, um, looking for cover looking to pick off the command structure as we discussed with um, 95th Rifles earlier. But the French have skirmish as well, as well. they're called voltageurs or jumpers, and they lead the assault through the woods. So they clash with the Jaegers and eventually force them from the woods back to the protection of the farmhouse. However, the voltageurs charge where when they emerge from the woods is checked by volley fire from the guards defending the south wall and gatehouse and it's the safe wall, south wall and gatehouse if you're again if you're watching on the youtube video that you can see in the in these pictures here um it's the larger of it's the actual gatehouse of of the farm the more the bigger of the two gates that, that the farm at Ugamon has and the vote, but the voltageurs were reinforced by line infantry and savage fighting in shoes, with attackers being thrown from the walls by the desperate defenders as they attempt to scale the walls. Uh, however, what starts as a diversionary attack was gradually sucking more and more men into the fray. The Pope, Jerome Bonaparte doesn't understand, or not he doesn't understand, but he takes it upon himself to escalate this fight more and more constantly requesting more troops to come in and although it would be a key position to take it's sucking more and more troops away and as more French reinforcements arrive are being sent to the battle of Uber when the fight begins to spread completely around the farm increasing the possession pressure on the beleaguered guardsmen inside now defending all four walls so at first it was just the southern wall now the fight is going all the way around with french assaults now on the north of the farm arti british artillery on the ridge were able to give supporting fire the, the diversion had turned into full-scale battle within a battle that would rage for an entire day and we'll show we shall return to ugamon later as we now need to shift the attention to the opposite side of the battlefield. So the assault on Ugamon was always going to be a diversionary move by Napoleon to draw defenders over the right over to the right of Wellington's line. When he felt that he had achieved this, he would make a massive assault on the left. This task was left to John Baptist Giroux. Giraud, Comte de Erlon, one of Napoleon's marshals who had faced Wellington in Spain. Around 1.30 p.m. de Erlon mustered his corps and set it in motion across the battlefield. Wellington and Uxbridge, his second in command and command of the British cavalry, looked on and pondered how to meet this threat. The first Allied troops at the assault encounters was Violence Brigade of Dutch infantry position forward of the ridge. Contrary to the common perception of the Dutch army at Waterloo, Violence Brigade put up reasonable resistance to this hammer blow of an assault, but eventually due to the overwhelming numbers broke. However, they were held, had held long enough for Wellington to send gallopers to Sir Thomas Picton, ordering his advance, ordering him to advance his 50 Division over the crest of the slope and halt the assault. Picton is always dressed in civilian clothing rather than the ornate uniform his rank would demand, led his division into the fray. 
Whilst riding at the front of his troops, urging them forward, Picton is hit in the centre of the forehead by a French musket ball. His body jolted, froze in the saddle momentarily, and then fell to the ground. The highest ranking officer to fall that day was dead. British officer, that is. Despite, his, despite the death of its commander, the 5th Division deployed into line and began to give volley fire at check to Erlon's men. However, due to their superior numbers, it would only be a matter of time until this overwhelmed the 5th Division. Something else needed to dislodge the French from this dangerous, from such a dangerous position. For this went and turned to Uxbridge. Waiting behind the ridge, there were two brigades of British cavalry, the Heavy and Union Brigade. It was at this moment that Uxbridge unleashed them into the Erlon's men. Over the top of the ridge they rode and slammed into the French line. The French broke like a wave on the bow of the of a ship a wave on the bow of a ship as the heavy cavalry pushed deep into the packed ranks of the French infantry, cutting and slashing their way through. Sergeant Ewer of the Scots Greys of the Union Brigade cut himself to the centre of the 45th EME Infantry Regiment. There he grasped the Chevis Eagle and ripped it from the hands of the 45th Colour Bearer. The fall of the colour sent the French rolling back. The attack by the Erlon's Corps had been defeated. At this point, though, a common problem in the command of the British cavalry raised its head once more. Instead of sounding the recall and bringing his men safely and victoriously back to the ridge, the British com the brigade commander, Sir William Ponsonby, led his men on. On they charged, ignoring the fleeing infantrymen and on into the French gun line. What they aimed to achieve riding that far without infantry support, we can only guess at. All they did was tire their horses and ride to disaster. For as, as soon as they'd reached the gun line, Napoleon's light cavalry launched their counter attack. These lighter equipped cavalry chased the exhausted heavies back into the valley, where, in amongst a churned up waterlogged ground, Napoleon's lancers, with the advantage of being able to kill at a distance, did their merciless work. The exhausted Union brigade was overwhelmed and felled. Among the dead was their commander, Ponsonby. The charge of the Union Brigade is one of the most famous events at the battle and is immortalised in Lady Butler's painting, Scotland Forever. Sergeant Newhart is buried in the parade outside of Edinburgh Castle, but as the stragglers made their way back to the ridge, attention once once more shift to Ugamon. As the Erlon's attack was beginning, a pivotal moment was occurring on the right of Wellington's line. As more and more men were pushed into the fight for Ugamon, a critical mass of men had begun to develop around the north gate. Eventually, these numbers came to tell. A French pioneer managed to get to the gate and began chopping at the gates with his axe. Eventually, the gates burst open and the French charged in. However, the assault on the gates hadn't gone unnoticed by MacDonald, a guards officer who attempted to arrange the defence. When the gates burst open, Macdonald's defence force was ready and engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the 30 or so Frenchmen that had gained entry. Whilst a number of the guards pushed against the gates, attempting to close them from them before the trickle of Frenchmen became a flood. After a mere seconds, which must have felt like hours, the gates were closed and barred with whatever the guardsmen had to hand. After closing the gates, the guardsmen set up that the French now trapped inside the courtyard, dispatching them with bayonets, all but a lone drummer boy who was completely unharmed was killed in the courtyard. The closing of the gates was, according to the Duke himself, the pivotal moment of the battle when he looked back on it in later life. The Battle of Ugamon would continue throughout the rest of the day and into the night, but never under a severe threat as when the North Gate was breached. The chapel will come to succumbed to fire during the battle, but the bastion on Wellington's right would hold despite everything the French would fight it. Sometime that afternoon, Napoleon is taken ill and has to leave the, bat the battlefield to rest. This is often referred to 
as stomach pains and may have been one of the initial signs of the stomach cancer that would take his, later take his life. In Napoleon's absence, a power vacuum occurs on the field in which Marshal Ney would ultimately take control of the army. Observing from his own position on the Belle Alliance ridge, Ney sees a stream of redcoats moving towards the rear. What are actually wounded men heading to the rear A stations at the Mont Saint Jean farm and in the village of Waterloo, Ney mistakes as a, as a retreating army. Thinking that, it, that victory is at hand, Napoleon's bravest of officers orders his cavalry to form up in in a mass block. Wellington sees his sees this and orders his army to withdraw 100 paces further down the reserves reverse slope to form a square. This is a formation where companies or regiments, if forming a brigade square, would wheel back on each other to form a hollow square with officers, drummers, and colours could be protected. With the front rank knelt and all men with fixed bayonets they presented an impenetrable hedge of spikes that also allowed for the rear rank still to fire. Squares own, had only one weakness, artillery. The withdrawal confirmed what, what Ney had expected that the British were falling back and ordered his cavalry across the valley. Ordered his cavalry on. Across the valley they charged and into the face of British artillery fire from the ridge. On they charged through the fire from the flanks of the, those guardsmen, those guards guarding Ugamon and Le Haysan. So massed were these charges that when they came through the gap between these bastions, the horses were in the centre, were lifted from the ground in the crush. On they charged up over the ridge, through the abandoned gun lines, the artillerymen and then running from the, for the squares after spiking their guns at the last minute and taking shelter under the muskets. On they charged into the face of the volley fire from squares, correctly positioned so that their fires didn't hit other, the other squares. Round and round they went the cavalry trying to find a point to break in without success. If only the artillery had been brought up or they had infantry support. Off they fell only to make another fruitless charge after fruitless charge. Wellington, meanwhile, was riding from square to square on his trusty Copenhagen, leaping over the squares whenever in, over and into the squares whenever danger approached. Ney had a number of horses shot from under him only to remount and try again, but all he succeeded in doing in these hours was to, was to buy time for Wellington and the Prussians, for now they were fast approaching from the east. When Napoleon returned to the field, he was in a rage with Ney as to why he had unleashed a cavalry charge without any support. However, with the cavalry forcing the redcoats back, he saw an opportunity to threaten Wellington centre and take the farmhouse of La Haye Saint. He moved his grand battery off the Belle Alliance Ridge and further forward to the low crest, further into the valley. He then sent infantry forward which, which also picked up remnants of Durlon's corps still fighting in the valley. They drove into the position, forcing the rifles out of the sandpit. The gallant defenders of the King's German Legion held off the attack. I'm assuming with the rifles with their, with their Baker rifles, they had the advantage of greater range and accuracy, although as a result they lost speed, so they could only fire two rounds a minute as compared to a musket three, which is one of the reasons why Napoleon himself actually never armed his men with rifles. He felt that um, speed was far superior to accuracy. The defence was stout, but eventually ammunition began to run low and the fire began to dwindle. The weight of numbers finally told and the position was overrun. The tree killer was placed on the roof of the farmhouse Wellington was facing a crisis which was about to get much worse. The Prince of Orange, the other Allied commander on the field, seeing the fall of La Haye Saint, ordered the, Bar ordered the Baron Christian Omtida's Opti King's German Legion Regiment to retake La Haye Saint despite enemy cavalry in close proximity. Omtida argued this to the prince, but eventually he gave in and ordered his men out of square and into the line to assault the farmhouse. No sooner as they began their advance, marauding French cuirassiers 
Napoleon's elite heavy cavalry came rushing out of the dead ground. Catching the Germans in line in open ground, it was utter carnage. Omtida's men had nowhere to, no chance at all and were cut down to a man. This is the, this is, this is the point if you've seen the 1970 film Waterloo, Christopher Plummer utters the line, give me night or give me blue cup. Whether Wellington actually said this or not, we do not know, but it must have been in his thoughts. If so, prayer, his prayers would soon be answered. For the Prussians were now streaming onto the field. Blucher's chief of staff, Gunn Eisenhower, directing his forces in one of two ways, either up onto the ridge to reinforce Wellington's decreasing position or into the ridges of into the village of Plassenois. When Napoleon, Napoleon is horrified when he hears that the threat that it was the Prussians attacking. Both Wellington and Napoleon had seen troops moving across, moving towards the battlefields, hoping it was their support, mixing up the, the Prussian blue slash black and the dark blue of Grouchy's men from a distance. It was hard to distinguish which. It was now that Napoleon was desperate for the third of his army that he had given to Grouchy. If the Prussians were here, where was he? Well, he was still miles away, engaged, entangled with the Prussian rearguard at Wave. Napoleon dis dispatched a few remaining reserve elements of his famed Imperial Guard to Plassenois, where a bitter fight ensued around the church. Napoleon had only one hope now. Can he hold the Prussians off long enough whilst he inflicted a crushing blow on the British? He summoned the remainder of his Imperial Guard. It was now it was time to throw the dice. Wellington on his ridge saw the French assembling for one more attack. He decided to give up his position on the left. The Prussians arriving on the flank could take that position. The new line now ran between the road and his bastion of Hougamont. The time had come for the defining moment of the battle. Napoleon himself led his Imperial Guard forward. His famed elite, his undefeated veterans were on the march once more. The kettle drums hammered in the Passo de Charge as they moved across the valley, only to pause to allow the, the men to shout the old war cry of Vive Empereur. Napoleon riding with them until Ney persuades him to return to safety. The British army artillery hammering away at the mass guards as they come past the bastions of Ugamon, the flanking fire from which made little effect. It seemed that nothing would stop these men in their white fronted uniforms and their bear skins and their moustaches. It seemed that Napoleon would win yet another victory. The cannon of Le Invalides Hospital would fire once more in Paris and another name would be added to the Arc de Triomphe. Yet in the, in the crops, the British waited. The foot guards on their stomachs waited for their moment. As the Imperial Guard mounted the crest of the ridge, Wellington cried out, now mate then, now your times. Up boys, up, up. With that, the guards rose and f fired volley after volley on the, on the guards. The guards stepped over their fallen comrades, pressing on, never defeated. The British line overlapped the French column. Colborne ordered his 50 seconds to wheel to, to the right to deliver fire upon the flank of the guard. The punishment being off, inflicted by the British muskets was brutal and beginning to take its toll. For the first time, the guard had met troops that had stood their ground rather than retreated, and the well-trained British soldiers were de delivering what no other army in Europe could. The guard had been stopped. Then an officer stepped out of the line, picked up a fallen eagle and said, Le guard recruit, Le guard retreat. As the guard stepped back, the British at first continued to fire into them. As it gradually tailed off, they looked to their commander for a signal. Wellington lifted his hat, circled it above his head three times and then pointed it forward.
the British Lion with a cheer stepped off after the quarry. The French artillery once more opened up to cover the retreat. One round shot came skidding close to Wellington. His second in command, Uxbridge, looked down, then calmly said to Wellington, By God, sir, I think I've lost my leg. To which Wellington replied, By God, sir, so you have. At which point, Uxbridge fell from his horse and was taken to the rear. By now, the cry of the guard recoup had spread throughout the French army. Across all positions, they were falling back from the ridge of Mont Saint John. The, the British and Allied armies advanced from the east. The Prussians were streaming into the field, onto the field in Plassenois. Resistance broke. The Prussians streamed forward. In the valley, Ney tried in vain to rally troops around him. Back at the Belle Alliance, Napoleon is ushered into his coach and sped away. The retreat was turning into a rout. The guard, in its last act of defiance, had formed a square to protect the retreat near the Mason de Calou. The, Briti Brit the British surrounded them, and then an officer stepped forward to offer them the chance to surrender. Debate remained over the answer. Some believe the answer came back. The guard, the guard dies, but it never surrenders. Others, that it was a simple one-word answer, mad. Either way, the next order was for the British to fire on the square, killing all in it. Back at the Bell Alliance, Wellington and Blucher met. Quelle affair, Monsieur, Blucher remarked. The Battle of Waterloo was over. At the Bell Alliance, it was agreed that the Prussians would take over the pursuit. The French would have one last victory on the outskirts of Paris, but for Napoleon, it was over. Soon later, he would surrender and be sent to exile in the South, on the South Atlantic island of St Helena, where he would die of stomach cancer in 1821. Marshal Ney was put on trial for treason and executed in Paris later that year. Arthur Wolsey would be created a duke and serve as commander in chief until the until his death and after having served two terms as Prime Minister. For the ordinary soldier there was an initial outpouring of celebration and respect. Medals were cast for the first time for the rank and file. However, this would not last long. There was no need for a large army in peacetime. One by one the soldiers were demobbed. The second battalion, the 44th East Essex, were demobbed on the dock side of Dover, following their arrival home in January 1816, having been part of the army of occupation. That was the thanks of the nation to the men that stood between them and Bonaparte. The Battle of Waterloo would usher peace into Europe that would last nearly a hundred years. It would lead to a redrawing of the map of Europe from which the next European conflict would come, but for, that is a story for another day. The battlefield today is littered with monuments, the large mound on, on top of which stands the lion. At the centre of the battlefield is placed upon the spot where the Prince of Orange was wounded during the battle. The mound itself was scraped from the earth of the ridge, which is why it no longer holds such a prominent position. When Wellington returned, Following the construction of the mound, he remarked, My God, what have they done to my battlefield? Elsewhere, more monuments have put up. There's a mon the monument of Napoleon in the, in the picture, if you're looking on the YouTube video, is at the Le Calou mansion. And the new monument at the bottom left depicts the closing of the gates at the north gate of Ugamon. By, a guard, by the two guardsmen, or by the guardsmen. This was placed there in 2015 to mark the bicentennial of the battle. Lastly, you have the monument of, of the fallen eagle at the site of the Imperial Guard Square at the end of the battle. That for me is one of my favorite monuments of all the monuments on the battlefield. There's also, for some reason, a statue of Napoleon behind what will be the British Lion at the Lion Village. And I don't understand why, because the French 
Napoleon never made it that far. And when you visit the battlefield today, it does have an air of lost causerism there for Napoleon that the British, the Dutch, the fought there and, and, and Prussians that fought there and won are often forgotten. It's a field like it's forgotten and it feels as if it's a French victory there rather than an Allied victory. Um, but that's my only personal take on that. Um, it's one of my favourite places to visit. Um, being a being actor myself, I've visited, I've actually had the fortune of fighting on the on the hallowed ground and firing from the walls of Ugamon um, is one of my highlights of of reenacting um, so this is a very um, special battle as far as I'm concerned so all I have to say now is thank you for watching and check back soon for further installments of Mark's English History Channel if you like what you see hit the like button give me a share and subscribe to the video but until next time, thank you and goodbye.